All right, what's up? Can you guys see me? It's my first time streaming on YouTube, so uh, let me know it's coming in good. All, all one of you. <laughs> so, mm, let me check. All right, so we'll just get started. And um, really, I just wanted to see if you would like to kind of help me brainstorm and uh, think about, you know, building that ultimate home lab. So the story was that I was, uh, you know, I have a home lab and, and one of my uh, servers just died. And from there, I decided to just build it a little better. So I started learning about Docker. I started learning about Docker Swarm. Um, I wanted to, you know, build my services in containers and not virtual machines. I wanted to also set up a low balance firewall cluster uh, with two IPs. I also wanted to integrate my Ubiquity switch and, you know, use that as well. And from all that, it was getting kind of, uh, it's just getting better. So let, let's just think about what we can do to just make uh, you know, what that home lab would be and then we're just gonna build a video series about it. And I'll just be building the lab and then from there, you guys can decide, um, you know, you just contribute your thoughts, um, ideas on you know, what that lab should look like. Does that sound good? Is anybody hearing me? Please chat. Please say something. All right. Well, I'll just get started. And, you know, you're welcome to, uh, you know, check out the video later and uh, see what's been, what's been coming along. But um, what I was thinking was, um, you know, when we think about, building that lab, I, I don't want to, you know, if one server dies, I wanted another server to kind of take over. So I was thinking something like a Docker Swarm environment, okay? So right now, we're gonna have sort of a Docker, actually, let's do this. Cause I actually have, I think three machines. And we're gonna have maybe, uh, this is gonna be DS1, DS2, and DS3. And now with three servers, this is gonna be the Docker Swarm cluster, okay? So we're gonna have a Docker Swarm cluster is what I was thinking to start off with. Now, another thing to think about is these are on, you know, these servers could be Raspberry Pis, they could be virtual machines, they could be actual servers, I don't know. But what I was thinking was, we've got to replicate the data across these Docker Swarms so that if one server dies, I still can have all my services on other areas, right? So that Docker Swarm is gonna balance it between both. So the goal is I wanna have whatever, you know, service, my, you know, whatever website I wanna host, Let's take, for example, um, maybe some movie software or some movie streaming software that I can stream from my home, right? So movie streaming, and let's say it's gonna be movie dot um, site dot com. Now, we want this to come in and then we want that traffic to load balance across a different container, okay? And then from there, how do we load balance that? Well, I was thinking traffic, like a traffic load balancer. What do you guys think? There's traffic, there's HA proxy, there's all kinds of free services. But I was, the reason I wanted to do a traffic load balancer, and I would love your thoughts, is a traffic load balancer, the cool thing about it is when you spin up a container, you can, um, it will actually tell traffic that, hey, a new container spun up and traffic will actually add it to the load balancing pool. 
So if you spin up any of these containers, it'll load balance. It will uh, load balance across any container. If one container dies, another container takes over. And that would be, I think that would be pretty cool, right? So I have this already set up. When, I, when my environment went down, I have this set up where any Docker container dies, it spins up. But another problem was replicating the files you know, across different Docker containers. They don't have the same files. So how do you achieve that? Well, um, there was, you know, there's replication services that kind of pretend to be like a RAID zero, but across a network, a, a network layer. So multiple servers kind of replicate their data. So that could be sitting on something like um, Ceph, Ceph FS or Gluster FS. So Ceph FS and Gluster. And feel free to look this up. But what this is, it will basically, if you have data stored on one server, it'll replicate it to another server. So now we've got all the Docker containers replicating their data, data and across the network. Okay? And if one server dies, the other server takes over, and you still retain the data. So imagine that a pie hole dies, or whatever server dies, it'll still, it'll still maintain service. So this would be, you know, the services that you could put on the Docker containers could be um, pie hole. What else? What else? What else would you guys want to load balance? Like a Jupyter notebook. Um, maybe uh, sonar. Maybe radar. Right. This is going to be for TV. This is going to be for movies. Like, whatever you want to replicate, you can do it in your lab environment. And if one dies, the other one takes over. So now you're not, you know, when the VM dies, it just comes back online on another Docker container, okay? And now taking a step further, we need to have a network, right? We need to have a network environment. So then I was thinking a DMZ, right? We've got a... We've got to poke a hole, right? If I'm going to access this from the uh, interweb, we've got to poke a hole. So if we want to poke a hole and we don't want to expose a external address or external um, IP, we don't want them to see our IP, right? We don't want them to see our IP. Let's say your home IP is 172.1.2.4. We don't want them to see our IP. So how do you do that? Well, you're going to have to proxy that connection to a proxy service. So a free service is what they call uh, Cloudflare. Cloudflare will proxy your connection and expose their own IP. So when someone tries to go to, um, you know, this, let me get this right here. Someone once tries to go to, can I copy this? Um, so when someone tries to go to, let me move this upstream here. When someone tries to go to a site, we can actually tell it to route to Cloudflare first, go to internet, route to Cloudflare's whatever their IP is, right? Whatever it is. And then it will make a proxy connection into the home. So they'll never know your IP. So wherever you can basically expose a DNS record and they'll never know your IP. And if you don't have a static IP, then you probably have to use some dynamic service like DuckDNS or something. So if you want to not expose your dynamic IP, you're going to need to use DuckDNS. All right? And what do you guys think so far? I mean, is this, is this, is this, going pretty well. Is there any thoughts around this? Um, so yeah, movie to the internet to Cloudflare, DuckDNS. Now, when it comes to your internal IP, you got a router, right? So in front of all this, you're going to have a router. So let's take a router in front of this. It's going to see, it's going to get bigger. It's going to get more complicated. So all in front of all this, We've got a router. 
Okay, so let me zoom out even more. So now we've got a router and then we've got a firewall and we've got to load balance, right? So let's think about it. Um, we're gonna have a firewall sitting in front of our network to protect us, right? Now you may have a local, you know, Netgear or some kind of local router or a local device. But what I was thinking was you would spin up a PFSense firewall. So this would be a, a PFSense firewall. Firewall, okay? So we'll be building a PFSense firewall to act as the, as the gateway. And then from there, we are going to send, poke a hole here and send that traffic. Let's actually move this. This actually is gonna go, this actually is gonna go up here now. And then we're gonna poke a hole right here so that the firewall will pass that traffic. So that's called port forwarding. We're going to let the movie route to the Cloudflare external IP so they won't expose our IP. And then it will do uh, CDN services. We're gonna proxy to our home IP so, the, so people can't see it. And then it's gonna poke a hole to the traffic load balancer. So this is gonna be the load balancer that's gonna load, load balance across your, your stack, right? And let me see here. Um, what do you guys think so far? Does that sound good so far? Let me see. One second, guys. All right, so, okay. So now I was thinking, okay, now that we have that, what was on my notes? Let me see. Um, what else? We also need to have a DNS, DNS, right? So that would be a pie hole. So we also need a pie hole to take care of our DNS for you. So we're gonna have to have a, a pie hole. a pie hole to do that. And we're gonna actually put a pie hole within the container environment. So it's gonna be a load balanced, DNS load balanced um, pie hole environment. Hey, Andrew, how you doing? So yeah, feel free to contribute. But I'm looking on building a lab and we're just gonna, um, after we figure out what we wanna, what this ultimate lab's gonna be, then I'm just gonna do a video series to build it out. So I'm gonna share you know, how we're gonna build it out. Here's the cool thing. A lot of this, I wanna do Docker containers because um, literally you can, when you build this environment, we are going to um, use Ansible. So all this is gonna be, all of this is gonna be through Ansible automatically. So within about 15 to 20 minutes, when you press enter, all three machines is going to automatically provision pie hole. It's going to set up the traffic load balancer. It's going to set up Jupyter Notebooks, Sonar, Radar, Plex, whatever you want. All the underlying services is going to spin up automatically within about 15 minutes from scratch. And all you have to do is use the Ansible script to load up the Docker Compose file, load up the containers, and then pie hole will be loaded. And I was also thinking of setting up a syslog ser server which I also already built a, uh, a Docker Swarm container for. So I've got a Docker Swarm for this. So, you know, let me just put check mark here. I got a Docker Swarm for that. I've got a Docker Swarm for that. I've got a Docker Swarm for the traffic load balancer. And then again, guys, it's all going to be uh, replicated across those three servers using a network uh, stack. Um, Andrew, is there anything that you wanna, that you you know, things you have that you wanna load balance? I was also thinking about setting up a home bridge or some kind of IoT automation. So there's a lot, of, there's a couple of Docker containers around home bridge for home automation. And the reason I like home bridge is because I've already got it working where my iPhone, I can uh, automate 
a lot of components with my iPhone. And I've got a lot of power plugs and I've got a lot of switches that's already um, has access, you can access it and it's available. So then really you just have Homebridge act as that IoT gateway, right? And another thing I want to do, we want to VLAN this all. We don't want them all on the same network. We want them all segregated on the same VLAN, right? So am new to Ansible, though, would you need something to track internal external network connectivity from a logging ops point? Um, you know, just to get started, you don't really need to. Let me tell you the flow of Ansible. Ansible, let me just scroll over here. Ansible is literally something like this. Let me just scroll over here. Ansible is, to put it simply, um, it's automating with SSH. So if you have SSH or you have Bash or you have some kind of shell, you can automate. And what it does, it will load its certificates. So you have to load the certificates on these three servers. And then when you load the certificates on the three servers, then um, you would push out the script. Now you can either do a push or pull. So you can push a script to the machine and say, download this, install this, and run this, and install that. Or you can do a pull method. You load the file on GitHub, and then you have your, your server wake up and say, you are going to have this role, this role, this role, and it will pull it from GitHub. So two different approaches. Um, I'm interested in, you know, I have Ansible working right now just as a push. So all you have to do is, uh, let me see, typical firewall blocks internal. But should you have an option to track internal devices going out online? I don't know. I don't know. What's the use case around that? Why would you want to track internal devices going online? Talking to a server or something? Because everything we're going to host is going to be here. So the Ansible box is going to literally be some, you know, some sidecar box right here on this, you know, on the network, and it will be segregated. Remember, we're going to want to put these in like, you know, VLAN one, um, and then we want to maybe put Homebridge because it's accessing the IoT devices, maybe in some kind of DMZ. I'm thinking, right? We want to put in a DMZ over here so that. Um, it's not, if it's compromised, it's still okay. So maybe you want to put this in its own VLAN, like a DMZ VLAN over here. We'll put it in a like a DMZ or something where Homebridge can access the devices, but and it can access all these IoT devices. Does that make sense? This is what I'm thinking. Like we want, we don't want the IoT touching our network. We want the IoT to just only talk to the home bridge. This IoT could be a Alexa also. It could be a Nest, right? They don't need to talk to their internal network. They don't need to uh, do something like that. So we, we could have Alexa, Nest. We want our smart home, our smart camera. So if those were hacked, because you're exposing all these to the internet, you know, you, you don't want them being compromised. So we need to put them in a DMZ. Yeah, exactly. Separated away for our traffic. And then only poke the holes through the firewall right here. So let me actually do this. I'll do, I'll do red as firewall. So the only hole we're poking is the firewall is touching the traffic load balancer. And then the traffic load balancer is touching everything underlying, right? And then you have to secure that. And then also Homebridge has an external connection, you know, routing outbound but it's not able to talk to that, uh, your internal network, okay? And then Ansible is probably gonna be in the secured area too. It's gonna be in the secured area where, you know, that, that box, you know, maybe we'll have one or maybe we'll have a VM. It's going to then want to access this or access Homebridge or, whatever, but it needs access, it needs SSH access. So you're just going to want to poke the holes to only allow Ansible to touch that network. So in your firewall rules, it's not actually going to go directly to it. 
it's going to say, I want to go to VLAN 1. The firewall says, OK, you can go. And then you go VLAN 1. You know, so it's going to be you're going to have to set up some firewall rules, right? But we're going to we're going to we're going to set it all up. Now, the firewall. Is there ways we can automate that the firewall? Because I was thinking of just configuring it from scratch and kind of just showing you guys how to do it. But is there a way we can automate it? Or should it, if I give you guys a configuration, would you just would you guys just want to load it? Or would you want me to tr tell you how how to build that firewall from scratch? Because some of the Docker containers, you don't really know. You don't really need to know how it's built. You just spin it up, and you're good to go. You know, within a couple of seconds, you'll have a container. But would you want to me to show you how a firewall works? What do you think? Um, yeah. So. So Pi-hole is going to have our DNS. It's also going to be our, our, our baby to kind of block a lot of ads. So let me show you right now. My Pi-hole right now is blocking a lot of crap. See right here? If you take a look, my Pi-hole is blocking a lot of stuff. See? So if you don't have a Pi-hole, look into a Pi-hole, OK? If you don't have a pie hole, look into a pie hole. And now you can block all these domains. See all these domains I blocked? 65,000 domains, right? This is all ads. These are all things that you don't want to go outbound. And you want to turn on DNS over HTTPS. We want to do, we want to make this, we want to make this shit secure, right? We want to do DNS pie hole, syslog. We also want to do um, uh, DNS over HTTPS to encrypt our DNS traffic. We also want to do um, the DNS security, DNSSEC, right, to secure our domains, right? And Cloudflare is hiding our internal IP, so there's no way you can access it, right? Here's another thing we're going to do. We're going to stick OAuth. So traffic, I already have OAuth working with Gmail. So if you have Gmail set up, I got OAuth working already. So yeah, we got OAuth. And literally, all you have to do is you need to provide a, you need to set up a Cloudflare account. When you set up a Cloudflare account, you need to get the API key. When you provide the API key in the, in the Ansible script, you put your API key, you put your domain, and it will automatically build the traffic load balancer, OAuth authentication, single sign-on into your Docker Swarm environment. And now, any new things you spin up in Docker automatically go up into traffic, automatically updates the DNS record within Cloudflare, automatically sets up the Let's Encrypt certificate, automatically... Uh, provisions it and you can literally once you spin up that site let's say you, you you press enter it takes about maybe 30 seconds or a minute to spin up a new container it will automatically build that whole environment for you I've already got the script that's what I've been working on and now all that happens you just have to make containers so any containers you spin up it's gonna automatically set up the domain single sign-on, it'll set up the uh, configuration, it'll set up OAuth authentication. But with the OAuth authentication, you have to do a whitelist. You have to put, you know, john at gmail.com, you have to whitelist, or jim at gmail.com, you have to whitelist. Because if you don't whitelist, everybody that authenticates with um, OAuth is going to get access. So you need to set up your whitelist. Who is allowed to access your environment? OK, so now you have single sign on on top of that. If you don't know, we're going to stick MFA on top of that. Now we can stick Authelia. Authelia is an open source MFA service. So if you don't know, look up Authelia. Authelia is an MFA service. So now you authenticate with single sign on and they've got to have your uh, key, you know, some authenticator key, right? And now you need my single sign-on and authenticator key, right? But 
I'm also going to help you set it up on Azure AD because a lot of us are learning Azure AD, so might as well learn Azure AD. So if you are interested, I will also, I also have it set up where we're going to provision this within Azure AD. So you're going to have your own Azure AD um, directory. You'll have your own uh, single sign-on, MFA, right? You know, if you're willing to pay for a little bit of the, the resources and things like that um, for Azure AD and want to learn, you know, in lab, you're going to learn about Azure AD. You're going to learn about single sign-on. You're going to learn about OAuth. You're, all this is going to happen automatically. It's going to be magic, right? Now, here's another thing. We want to automate this. So the reason we have a syslog server, right, the reason we have a syslog server is because I'm, you know, I'm all into Sentinel, we're going to send those logs to Sentinel. And I'm going to show you how to save money in your home lab so it won't cost a lot. My home lab for Sentinel, I'm paying with my own money. Well, it's like, well, not my own money, but I get, I get a little bit of credit every uh, month. Um, and it's not much money. It really is not much money. It's a, basically, they charge you per, per consumption. So if you only control at the collector and then you, 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 you parse it at the collector and you only send important stuff, you trigger the alerts in Sentinel, and then Sentinel does your automation for you. So I think you can get it. Dev MSD account for a free trial. Um, I could check into that. I could check into that. I'll see what's available. But really, um, if you set up Sentinel, the way I, I'll show you how to set it up, and you, you're only looking for main alerts, it's like five, 10 bucks because you're not ingesting all the logs. And then when you trigger a log analytics uh, flow, so like automation, like a playbook, that's like you pay like a couple, like, I don't know, 10 cents per run. So here's an example. Here's what's happening right now. So I got my barbecue equipment right now. I'm sorry, barbecue equipment. I've got my uh, refrigerator, my freezer, and I've got all this barbecue. And I've got all this um, food, right? And it's important for me. So I'm going to draw. I'll show you what it looks like. So I got a barbecue over here. And over here, imagine I have a refrigerator. And I've got my barbecue, right? I got my barbecue. These are important stuff. I have this plugged into a power switch, OK? This power switch, right? This power switch is a IoT device. And then I, this IoT device reports syslog. So it's feeding syslog. If you want to know what this is, look up Sonoff Tasmoto. Tasmoto, Tasmota. If you look off Sonoff Tasmoto, Tasmota, it's really you take a, a power plug that you buy that's like 15, 20 bucks, and then um, you hack it. And then you, t you basically, it turns into an open source tool, and it has HTTP and syslog. And it has, you know, you can, it has an API interface. And then what you do is you feed that syslog to the syslog server, which is load balanced across the Docker Swarm environment, so you always will get those logs. And it's ingesting to Sentinel. And the moment that, and what we're doing, what, what, what are we doing? Well, what's happening is it's, it's, it's sending syslog every one minute. So the device is sending every one minute, it's sending a heartbeat to Azure Sentinel. And if I don't see a heartbeat for the last 10 minutes, the server, I'm sorry, Sentinel will say, hey, I haven't seen a heartbeat in 10 minutes. Your barbecue, your, your meat's gonna, gonna go bad, right? And then you get an alert. So what happened, uh, if you don't know, Houston had a freeze and uh, I, didn't have, um, I didn't have power. So I, on my phone, I was getting alerts that I, it lost uh, visibility to a lot of my IoT devices, right? This scenario could be a scenario you can implement in your work, right? Monitoring your devices, only looking for devices that um, haven't reported in in the last 10 minutes, right? So you report this via, IO, you know, this refrigerator hasn't reported in, we lost power, it hasn't reported logs, and then you do a... Uh, you do a automation script through playbooks, right? Playbooks is, if you don't know, it's GUI-based programming. 
All right? Let me show you how crazy it's, it is. Like, you can set up any type of automation you want just with playbooks, okay? So let me show you real quick, just so you know. What do you want to see? Tell me what you want to see. I'll, I'll do a live right now if you guys are willing to tell me what you want to see. But um, watch. Let's create, a, let's create a playbook. I'm going to create a playbook. Tell me what you want, all right? What do you want to see? It has so many uh, things you can do with this, and you don't have to pay much money because it's, it's, it's a consumption model, and you're not really consuming it unless that refrigerator goes down, right? So let's do a, uh, what we call a logic app. And we're gonna create a new one real quick. And then, well, let me do test work group, okay. And we'll do a test playbook, okay? And here, um, just trying to get something unique. Okay, we're gonna create it real quick. Hmm? Uh, oh, disable, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. I need to create something. So when you create a playbook, what's gonna happen is here, I'm gonna show you how easy it is. Watch. So we go here, and then we go to blank, let's go to a blank app. Let's say we make, we wanna make an API thing, right? And um, so let's make API. Uh, so let's do a request. So when you make an HTTP request, what, what's going to happen? You can specify the body. So you can say, you can say, um, we want to. Oh, actually, let's do some automation. So let's we're going to make an API. So let's just do test. Let's do test colon test. Okay, there we made an API. Simple as that. We made an API, and now. I want to send an email. Or you want to do a ServiceNow ticket. We got a ServiceNow ticket. If you have like that ServiceNow developer stuff. Or you can do um, an email. Let's just do an email. Or you can actually send an API outbound somewhere else. But let's do an email. And you could do this with your um, Outlook subscription. So yeah. And then you just want to send an email. Send an email. Boom. Send an email to jjna uh, at gmail.com. And then we'll say subject is test email, test email, right? Oh, it's not supported. But you get the point is you just type in what you want here, and then you're done. You're, you're done. I don't know what's happening. Huh. Let me see. Oh, I don't have authorization. It's fine. But you get the point. So you set up your um, playbook, and then you can automate and do a lot of things. So a playbook could be that if a Sentinel alert gets triggered, you have it go send an email, or you can have it send a text message via Twilio, or you can have it do this or that or this. OK. Think it's called free Microsoft 365 E5 developer subscription. I'll check into that. All right. So. We have automation. What do we, what else we want to do in this lab? What else do we want to do in this lab? We've got DNS. We've got DNS over HTTPS. DNS security. Firewall. We've got single sign-on. We've got, let me write it all down what we have. Let me see. So we have single sign-on. We have OAuth. We have DNS over HTTPS, like this is all stuff I want to do in my home so that I can kind of encrypt my traffic. We have DNSSEC. What else we want to do, guys? We have a syslog server to collect those logs, centralize those logs for our home. We have PyHole to be the DNS and also block DNS sites. And we have Ansible to automatically uh, provision the environment really quickly. Even if our environment dies, we spin up a new box, and we just load our Ansible script from a GitHub repo. Cloudflare, right? We got Cloudflare. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have Cloudflare. And that's what's going to give us. What's that going to give us? That's going to give us a proxy so they won't see our IP. That's going to give us a CDN. 
that's going to also do DDoS protection. All this is free, so you know, for your home lab, it'd be great. You know. And we need uh, certificates, right? We need we need to have the Let's Encrypt. Any ideas? Anything you want? Anything I'm missing? Like you want to you you want me to build out that would make this really cool? We got Homebridge for IoT devices. If you guys don't use Homebridge, um. You know, we can go into Homebridge and automating and talk about how you automate that. Talk about Z-Wave, Zigbee. We could talk about, you know, which one's better, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Wi-Fi, which one I prefer. We could also integrate, um, what else is there? What else is there, guys? Oh, we need Jupyter Notebooks so that we have sort of a, uh, a way to kind of like a workbook to kind of run things quickly and troubleshoot things. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'll help you build this out because I have a lot of this already automated. Most of this stuff, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, it's built. You give me a VM, 10 minutes with Ansible. 10 minutes, so... You give me a VM and we'll, we'll, it, it'll build out the whole environment. It'll build all this out. And all you have to provide is, you know, a couple of credentials like domain name, um, you, your email address. Uh, and you also, also have to specify the host names. Each of these, you might want syslog to be like another name like log or, you know, the subdomains. You might want this pie hole to be something else. But the goal is... All this is going to be easy. It's going to be configured. When you when it uh, dies, another d like literally, if you think about it, what has to die? You know, if if the Docker swarm dies, one server dies, right? If one of these dies, you still have access because the data is being replicated on this uh, cluster environment. Oh yeah, we got to put CephFS. We got to put uh, replicated replicated data data um so when one server dies it's replicated right if this dies you're if this you can't have more than um one server die though that's one thing that's one caveat you can't have more than one server die so if you have three servers and one of them die you better you better spin up another box and get that cluster and get that vm back up and running that's the caveat if you don't then you're gonna you're not gonna lose everything but your services go down, okay? What else? You guys, if you guys want to do like, um, you know, you guys back up your books. If you guys back up like your your books, you know, and stuff like that. There's a, you can uh, load your books and then have a web browser connect to your book, and then you can have you can browse your books with a what we call a a Mobi app. So that you can just browse your books with this app and um, kind of access your local books through a web hosted service. So all you need is a Mobi URL, and then you can access all your books as if it's like a gallery, right? And you would expose that to your, you know, book.site.com. All this sounds like it's a lot of work, but literally, literally, the config will do a lot of the work. All of these are already um, in Docker containers. I spent weeks trying to find a Docker container for everything. Then there was not a there was not a Docker Swarm template. So then I spent even more time trying to build a compose file for every single one of these services. But I've got it now, and it load balances. And you shut one off, another one comes up. And also those certs, that cert is replicated across all because it's all connected to the same replicated file system, right? The configuration files, great. The logs are rotating, right? It's a lot of good stuff. Your, your configurations are being backed up. Oh yeah, we gotta do backup, guys. We need to back up our Google stuff. So here's another thing. 
Oh, I forgot to talk about that. I also set up Google Sync. So here, here we go, here we go. So if you guys have, you know, I have OneDrive and Google, so I have three back, I have two backups. So if you have Google Drive, or if you have Google Photos, or if you have um, OneDrive, or if you have Amazon Photos, you gotta back up those photos, guys. What if what if something happens and have you guys backed up your photos? Like literally, have you guys backed up your photos? Like, do you have your photos on a hard drive somewhere? Probably not because there's so much so much data, right? And then Google Photos or Google Drive, they all kind of store it. So you're gonna need to store that data locally just so you have your own secondary backup. That way you can take the data and then go somewhere else with it or whatever. So I have my data replicated to two different file servers and um, locally, right? Good, good, Google Drive and NAS, perfect, perfect. So I have a, we need a Docker container for this. We need the Docker container to go and sync this all up automatically for us. We don't wanna do it. We wanna provide our credentials. And here's a cool thing, Ansible, you encrypt that cert, you encrypt it. So you encrypt it on Ansible and then you store it in the Ansible locker and it's encrypted. It's encrypted and you sync it through Google Drive. So you provide your API keys and all that stuff that you set up and it's encrypted to, it's, encrypt, it's encrypted and then it does a, so that if, so, if that was a compromise, they wouldn't be able to get those keys, right? Um, you need to use this analogy on a APC UPS that's overlooked. Oh, I had a power cut and waiting for a placement PSU. Oh, okay. Synology APC UPS. So, um, great point. So here's another thing. So here's what happened. I'll tell you a story. So I actually got uh, two huge APC 2200s. These these are really big, really big ones. So here's the trick. I'm going to share you a trick. It's going to save you a lot of money. I bought two, look it up, APC 2200 used with LCD screens, dual, right? And I got them um, for $150, both of them, $150. How did I do it? You go into the uh, recycle places, those recyclers, and you look up the serial number and see if it's covered. And if it's covered, if it's under warranty, you own the hardware, so they ship it back, they ship it to you. So, yeah, so I got, um, I checked it out and then I was like, oh, it's still under warranty. So they, they sent out, I said the battery wasn't working, it's not working good, and then they sent me two. It was so heavy though. I had to have some help to uh, lift it out, but Two rack mount APC 2200s. They sent it to me in the mail free of charge. And they paid for the shipping of these other APCs back to them. So, yeah, it was, uh, if they're under warranty, I mean, they have to cover it. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, that's, what I, that's what I did. And it worked for me. So, $150. I got two APC brand new ones for, yeah. It was a pretty good deal. And here's what I'm doing for my, uh, my I, I know you guys are talking about Synology, but I'll show you guys real quick. I'm using Unraid. See guys, I'm using Unraid, okay? So Unraid is what I use, right? Unraid and Synology are kind of the same. They both have apps, right? You both have apps you can run, right? So they all, both have apps, things like that, but that's what I'm doing. And here's another trick if you are if you want to know how I got this server. A lot of organizations are shifting to the cloud so they're decommissioning their servers. So go to eBay and look up R720, look up R520, look up or or that look up some special words. Like if you go look up and you go to eBay, I I got literally 40 terabytes 128 gigs of RAM, two dual core processors, and um, it's on a, uh, it's, it's eight, 
yeah, it's eight drives. Yeah, it's it's a lot of space. And I got it for like 500 bucks. And how did I do that? Well, you just have to type in like Dell R. Let's try seven. Let's try 710. And then let's type in 128 gigabyte. Or if you want terabytes, if you're looking for space, type in like, think about it. If it's two terabytes and it's uh, it's maybe one, two, three, 12 bays. So 12 times two, that's 24. So maybe 24 terabytes. Like think about the math. And then you can try to find a cheap server, right? And just keep an eye. Like think about the keywords. Don't look, don't just type. Don't just type R710. You might not find what you want. There's so many out there. But what you want to do is you want to find one that is like, that's not the buy it now, but the one that's like, you know, going through the cracks. And you want to type in like 24 terabytes, uh, 128 gigs of RAM, right? And this is like, this is a RAID array or something like that. But man, oh, they're kind of expensive now, but I got one pretty good. Um, you just have to kind of, you just have to kind of just like Dell, Let's see, let's try four terabytes. Four terabytes times 12 is 48 terabytes. Um, 128 gigs, oh well, no, that's not it. And you could do HP too, do HP. HP servers are sometimes a lot cheaper too, right? But try to find one that's a really good deal. Like try to find a steal because they're trying to push out these server and just get rid of it. These, these are all recyclers. Here's another tip, here's another tip. So when you go to the recycler, you know, the recycler near you, they will hook you up because you say, hey, you don't want to ship it. Like, you don't have to ship it. I'm going to go pick it up. So you go here, go here, and then type in um, within 150 miles right here, and then type in of, you know, of your zip code. And then now you're finding local, local places that's like selling near you or something like that, right? to maybe find someone near you to be like, hey, you can save some money and um, give it to me directly. So they'll cut you a deal. They're not having to ship it out. They don't have to pay, um, they don't have to pay, you know, eBay fees. So you're saving them money. You're saving them the, uh, to, uh, you know, the uh, work to ship it. And then you might be able to get a bundle deal, things like that. All right, so that's just a couple tips, all right? See, so yeah, I got Pi-hole set up. I've got, here's my traffic low balance. I'll show you, I'll show you. I type in traffic and that's it. It's OAuth authentication and boom. I've got my traffic low balancer stack. Bada bing, bada boom, just working all nice and smooth. And this happens, you can spin this up automatically, you know, with a Ansible script. You just have to provide your, uh, you have to provide the machine and then it loads up and you have light mode if you like light or dark mode. And has all the all the services, right? And then you can start building your dashboard. You know, you build your own dashboard, your own little your own little dashboard, right? And then from there, we can add an application here, so that you know you have a little bit of dashboard, like you know maybe you want to do um you know book app, I don't know, but book app, whatever you want, and then you uh, you add you know you add your application. Uh, you know, and they have also organizer and other stuff. I mean, I'm sure there's others, but I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, it's just application. Then you make a little portal page. You can have this portal page maybe uh, allow certain people access to this, certain people access to that. You're controlling it with OAuth, right? Because your OAuth, you now see the user inside the cookie, right? All right, so yeah, dude, this is yeah, a lot of stuff. Okay, also, I got Portainer, so you got Portainer. So you don't actually have to go to command line. I have Portainer already set up, see? Portainer is already set up, guys, for the containers. I have a lot of containers, see? So Portainer's already set up, so you can manage it. You wanna, you wanna go into a VM? You do this. I wanna go to my JupyterLab VM. I wanna click here, connect. Boom, Jupiter Lab BM. Boom, yeah. So, you know, this is going to be pretty sweet, dude. And all this uh, again, we want this to be set up automatically. We want to take a fresh box because you know a lot of us just like to start from scratch. So get a fresh script. You have your config file. You got your you got your um, configuration, 
and spin up another box, start migrating. Another thing, a cool thing about Ansible, if, um, if, yeah, dude. You, so what I want to do is I want to make a portainer template. So what happens is, and I want you guys to help me with that, right? We're going to make a, and I'll show you, a portainer template, app template. See, you see all these templates, but we're going to make our own. And when you click, boom, like you load it. Now you it adds it it adds it to the cluster. You click this one, boom, it adds it to the cluster, and uh, it just it just spins it up in your uh, in your cluster environment, right? Portainer already connects to the environment, and if you add more stuff to it, it already knows, right? So, yeah, definitely, we're going to add all that up, and yeah, you can have a mixed environment um, with ARM and x86. So I haven't tested it. We need to test it, so maybe you can help test it. But yeah, a mixed, a mixed uh, ARM template. I want some pie holes. I want some pie holes. I want some. Um, and here, the th the cool thing about Ansible is here's the cool thing about Ansible. If you um, here's a cool thing. If you have, uh, let me see, um, Ubuntu. If you like Ubuntu. But let's say Ubuntu like wants to charge you. Like, have you guys heard that CentOS is like trying to charge a little? It's like now, I don't know if it's still free, but I'm sure there's a community side. But I know that I think I think they're trying to charge or something like that. I heard something. But let's say you don't want to use CentOS anymore. You literally just um, the the configuration automatically will provision the same thing in Ubuntu. Now there may be commands that might match, so you'll have to configure it to accommodate that in the Ansible script. But then, boom, you can spin up Ubuntu. If you want it to work in ARM, you have to tell Ansible. Ansible is going to check it. It's going to say, what's the VM? Oh, it's Ubuntu. What is the uh, version? OK. What is the uh, CPU? Oh, it's that. And then it's going to provision it because you set it up. So it's going to be some work to set up the magic template to kind of see this environment. But then it just works. You can have Ansible also work in Windows if you set up that Win uh, that SSH thing for Windows. Because Ansible works with SSH. So anything that works with SSH or you can set up a cert on one of those uh, you know, uh, SSH certs, it can, it can provision it. So we can provision, provision boxes that have SSH, right? It doesn't have to be Ubuntu or CentOS. It could be um, a VMware server. It could be an Unraid server. It could be a, if Synology, does Synology have SSH? I don't know. I've never touched Synology. I'm always interested, but I've always, I have two Unraid servers that is, uh, and that's, you know, that's what I, that's what I've been using. I've always been interested in uh, Synology. I just, I just, I just never used it. You know, we all have our things we just stick to because we don't want to learn something else because it just works. Um, what else, guys? Okay, so, I mean, it's looking pretty good. Google Drive, so we need backups. What else we need for this ultimate lab? This is going to be a long, this will be a lot of work, guys. But, you know, like, here's the cool thing. When we, uh, when we build one thing, we add a template. Now that you have the template, you never have to touch it again. You never, like, that's what I wanted. And when you build, when you build something, you never have to have a template again. So you spend one time building something and you never have to touch it again you have a container for it that's the goal is i want to build it once and never have to touch it again so it will be a work in progress but i did a lot of stuff already i found a lot of uh, repositories and yeah oh yeah remote access good idea so here's the cool thing um guacamole someone built a guacamole docker container if you guys don't know what guacamole is, it's a web-based remote session. And it will it can do RDP, it can do SSH, it can do uh, VNC, it can do it all. And it's like it's like it's like butter. It's when you set it up, it can just connect to anything in your environment, kind of like Portainer. So guacamole is going to be good for RDP and things like that and connecting to those. And then what you can do is you can set that up as the uh, the saw the secured access workstation, right? What's a saw, guys? Why do, you want, why do we want a saw? Why do we want a secured access workstation? You want to set up firewall rules to block any IP 
to access remotely these stuff. Okay? That way, if an adversary was to get into your environment, he doesn't get access to your the golden box that has access to everything. You wanna you wanna secure that with a firewall rule. Okay? Only certain IPs can access it, okay? So you want to have a secure access workstation that can access everything in your environment. So make sure, think about that, right? You know, we want to build this home lab secure as possible, right? And the VPN connection, good idea, good idea. A VPN connection so that, wow, this is getting, this is getting complicated, guys. I'm going to build a diagram. Let's build a diagram on this. Let's build a Visio diagram, okay? <laughs> so, of... Let's talk about VPN, right? If we have, if we have like, like guest, if we have IoT, if we have, what else? Mm, what else we want to throw in a VPN? We want to throw Alexa on a VPN. We don't want Alexa on our stuff. We, we don't want anybody to know our IP. We want to encrypt it too. Uh, we want Nest. You know, we want to stop all these, you know, things talking to the VPN and we want to control it right and have this all route through a VPN good 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 I think that's a good idea great idea we need a VPN so I haven't figured out yet so maybe you guys can figure it out I don't have a docker container for this yet so if you can find out a docker container that and you don't it doesn't have to be swarm or compose i can make it into a swarm or compose file so that we can be in a cluster but a docker container that has an out that can you know you you basically spin it up with an environmental variable like you know pia or whatever vpn service you want and then it will make a open uh open ssa open vpn connection right and it maintains the connection and we need a fail safe we need this to have a fail safe Right? If the if the the fail safe is if the VPN connection goes down, we don't want that traffic to go outbound. We don't want it to go upstream. Okay? So we need a fail safe. Yeah. A fail safe will be good. Um a fail safe. A VPN connection. Encrypt that traffic. Now, you're going to you're going to probably need access like you know when you do a uh, Netflix on VPN it's like it'll be confused and then it doesn't work right. So you still might need to access like like another area that uh, maybe doesn't go through the VPN for like Netflix. So maybe for this area like this um what we call this? This like safe area. Um May, we'll call it trusted, trusted devices. Yeah, I think that's a good word. We'll call, so the networks we're going to have, here, here, I, we got to think about this. The networks we're going to have is going to be DMZ. I'll show you my network. I'll show you my network. We can work off that. We can show, we can, we can work off my network. And I have this on a, uh, I have this as a carp, right? I have this as a carp, okay? So um, I have this as a carp IP. I'll show you if I know what the heck I'm looking at. Is it aliases? I set up a while back. Virtual IPs, here we go. So I set up a carp IP, see that? I set up a carp IP and um, that way if one firewall dies on one server, I have another firewall. So. Think about it. I have a Docker Swarm virtual machine. It dies. The firewall dies. I still have outbound connectivity because I have a CARP for every single VLAN. Every single VLAN default gateway is going to my CARP IP, right? So, so I have what I have. I have wireless IoT LAN servers management DMZ. Wireless IoT. Wireless... I have a uh, wireless, I have IoT, I have um, LAN, like, you know, wire connections. I have uh, servers. Management, VLAN, we need all VLANs. 
management, VLAN. So DMZ wireless, IoT LAN, servers, management. What else do we need? Um, oh, trusted. Because remember, wireless could be two different two different VLANs. Wireless could be, um, you know, untrusted. We'll call it untrusted. Untrusted wireless, and then trusted. And trusted, we track with MAC address, right? MAC address. And you know what? We'll set up a flow. We'll set up a flow that says, if, you know, when someone wants to um, get on the uh, trusted and they said that something's not working, we'll set up a flow that says, go to this website, um, put in your uh, MAC address, and then click submit, and it will add the MAC address to PFSense. Like, we're going to make that flow. So we're going to make an automated flow to whitelist that IP because I don't want to mess with uh, I don't want to mess with uh, going to uh, I don't want I don't want to touch PFSense. So I want but I want to push the approve button. I want to have an approval I want to have an approval workflow. Yeah. Uh, for Red Hat Linux, are they changing? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Um, what about printing? Maybe list essential minimum specs. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Primary backup, secondary backup option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a Google Drive, OneDrive, and maybe another server. For this, though, are you applying zero trust concepts on it? I would like to. I would like to. Do you have a framework that we want to follow? Um, like, we don't have to go hardcore, like totally hardcore, because, again, if you know, I'm I'm automatically building this, uh, building out this environment with uh, Docker containers as or an Ansible as much as I can. Yeah, if you if you want to put zero trust, I mean that that might not be a bad idea. Let's think about a framework for that. So, yeah, zero trust. Zero trust. Zero trust. You know, we got to learn this. Will this will be also good learning opportunities once we know this, dude. We're gonna learn it all. We're like, we'll like we'll know so much things. Ansible, Ansible is a job in itself. Like if you know Ansible, that's a job in itself. Sentinel, if you know Sentinel, that's money. That's money right there. It's 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 growing fast. Sentinel, Ansible. Um, if you know data replication, um. If you know, if you want, if you start knowing Azure AD and things like that, managing it, that's that's going to be good as well. OAuth authentication, single sign-on. Once you know the goal is, I mean, that's why we lab is because we want to we we, we want to learn, but also kind of have something cool at home to have a protective environment at home. Okay. All right. Um. What else? What do you guys use for your uh, home lab? Um, I put books down, but I'm sure you guys are like backing up your um, your value, you know, your your your, your um, backups. You have backups of like, you know, whatever. So you you know you you want to back up, you know, all those backups. But um, yeah, books, comic books, um, shows, whatever, you know, um. And have it locally, you know, back up those DVDs and uh, Blu-rays and things like that, you know, so that if the Blu-ray or uh, DVD dies, you have, you know, you have backup, you know. Um, what else? Well, I mean, are, are we good? Like, is there is there anything else that we can add to this? Oh, email. Email, guys. Let's make our, uh, let's say, make our own mail server. We're gonna make our own mail server. We don't have to route outbound. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a script for that too. We got our own mail server. Yeah, Plex. Yeah, play those home videos. Um, the mail server. Yeah, so that when you want to send out emails, you don't have to actually send it to a, a SMTP server. You actually have your own SMTP server. You know? Yep. It all goes to storage, replicates to the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, what else? What else? Okay, here you guys. I'm gonna give you guys some uh, some stuff to play with. So I'm gonna share you 
the two best links that I found was really helpful. Smart home talk, uh, uh, what was that traffic? This one was really helpful. Um, so this guy, here you go. Um, go to smart home, go to this smarthomebeginner.com or type smart home beginner and type in a uh, traffic. Uh, the person who wrote this is amazing. I'm sorry, I don't know who wrote it. Uh, I guess Anon and Seth. But this is amazing, guys. Go to it. Literally. I didn't follow this flow. I actually discovered it after the fact. But I'm going to incorporate many concepts from this because he set up a lot of stuff, right? So I, so what was, what was ridiculous is uh, I set up a lot of this by myself. And then I found this after the fact. So, but, you know, we're going to build, we're going to build our own. We're going to build our own thing and we want to, but this is not Ansible, guys. This literally like is like step by step by step by step by step of setting up your own Cloudflare account, setting your own Docker, setting up your own Compose, configuration, environment. It, he goes through everything. He explains the traffic load balancer, right? And I'm going to go through this. Okay, I'm going to go through this. But he set this all up, guys. He took screenshots. He explained it. He explains the load balancer. So everything and we're going to build out, um, I want to do this with a script. Okay, I don't want, I know that we, we want to learn. And definitely, well, you want to learn. Go through this. Learn it. But, so you know the concepts. But, don't just, you know, when I give you the, I, I, when I give you the Ansible script and I give you my, 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 my crown jewel, don't just load it. Learn, right? Learn how it's built how it was built and and then when you learn it you know how it was configured and then you can make your own docker containers kind of like i did you can make your own docker swarm right but this is an awesome link guys he sets up everything like a lot of things he tells talks about cloudflare setting up your own let's encrypt cert having it automatically set up a wildcard cert and having all your services Everything within traf everything within Docker spin up and then it goes in traffic. What he didn't do was um when you spin up a Docker container and you have a host name like a subdomain like like I do, like blah dot whatever dot com, I want to provision that host name upstream. So I have a script for that actually. So it's just a script. So if anything spins up, Traffic will put it in a low balancing pool, and then we will uh, add the DNS record, and we have a Let's Encrypt cert and OAuth authentication, and whitelisted, you know, for the users you have in your environmental file. Okay, that whitelisting is gonna be very important. Um, but this is a uh, awesome. So this is gonna be fun if you want to just tinker around, learn about like a little bit about it. Um, and how everything works. It might be overwhelming, but man, he's going, he's going, he's going line by line showing you how it works. So awesome script. Um, but yeah, guys, this is going to be a great resource for you to kind of just get with the flow and kind of just think about how you want to build the home lab. So he also has OAuth and Ophelia. He has single sign on and MFA, right? So this is, he, he did a lot of work on here. So we're going to, we're definitely going to leverage it and we're going to, you know, um, be sure to, you know, give him kudos. Like if there's, I don't, I don't know if there's, if there's a way to, if he has a, you know, a way to donate, I mean, but it's a lot of work he did. So kudos, good stuff. Um, and if you guys want to share any links, definitely. He doesn't have a cluster. That's what I'm, we're going to do. So this is the deficiencies. He doesn't have a cluster. He, it's, it's not replicated. He doesn't have a Docker I don't think it's a Docker Swarm. It doesn't. It's not a Docker Swarm environment. It's one machine, so it's not too bad. You're going to spin it up on one machine, and then it'll just boom, 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 boom. And he has basically like a magic um, 
compose file that will spin it up. So if you dig around, there's actually a GitHub um, repository. And um, he's he literally will just flow you. Uh, he, he literally has a Docker compose file that will spin it all up. And you just have to provide the, like, these variable in the variable file. And then it spins it all up. So be careful, because throwing it on a pie might, well, no. I don't know. I will be interested. Let me know. Like, when you throw it on a Raspberry Pi, like, let, let's look at it real quick. Let, let me pull it back up. I'll show you real quick. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll, I'll, let me explain real quick, because Smart Home Beginner Traffic, yeah, it's like one of the top ones. But he has also a lot of great blog posts, too. And where is the, tr where is this GitHub? So he he shows you what it is, but then he throws it on GitHub. See, he throws it on GitHub, and see, and here it is. Uh, is that it? Yeah, the Docker Compose. Okay, here's the caveat. Um, what do you need to do if you don't know what Docker and you never mess with it? You're gonna have to install Docker. You need a either a Linux or a Windows machine with the uh, Docker installed. And then you're going to provide an environmental file right here. This environmental file is going to be very important. You provide all the necessary variables. This is what I'm talking about. When you provide an environmental file, it's going to have all the right variables to go do all this stuff. So you, have, you do have to spend some time to populate the variables, but you don't, have to, you don't have to spend time configuring it. And you populate the variables, and you never... You know, hopefully you never have to configure it again, or if you do, you just configure the environmental file. But now you have this file, this golden file, and you want to keep it near and dear because it's going to ask for API keys. It's gonna, it's gonna have, yeah, it's gonna have a lot of, a lot of stuff. So you need to, you need to, you need to guard this thing. But that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have an environmental file that's gonna be the reference point that Ansible will leverage to spin out your all the whole environment, okay? It's gonna spin it all up. He also, so right here, if you see right here, he did um, like a NUC template that, you know, he has a, yeah, a NUC um, arm. See, I don't see arm template, but what most of the, I mean, most of you are gonna use this one, the YAML, the YAML file, and then that's the compose. So you're, you'll put Docker compose and then spin it up. And we'll go through this later. But if you guys want to just, you know, you, you, you have an itch, then yeah, have fun. Because this is a lot of stuff that I might be uh, covering as well. Um, but he has a lot of cool stuff. And he's using this analogy. Yeah, here you go, Synology NAS. So he's using a Synology in the, uh, is, that, is that within Docker? Is this Synology within Docker, guys? Uh, home address NAS Synology. Is this Synology and Docker? Um, you know, guys. Let's see. Oh, it is. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's Synology right here. Synology. Uh, it's a work in progress. Okay. You see. It looks kind of like if you've never seen a YAML file and it looks and, and, and you never like touch Docker Compose, it may seem kind of um, overwhelming, right? But I'll show you, okay? Don't worry. That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna take you from start to finish. From you know we're gonna start off and I'm gonna show you how Docker works, how to build a compose file, you know the tricks that I learned. And we're going to build it from the ground up. I'm not going to just say, um, go to Docker and run this file. Boom. And then it's set up. I'm going to show you. I'm going to explain everything. How it's built so you can build your own stuff. You can accommodate your own scenario. You can build whatever, whatever stuff you want to build. Whatever crap. Because this is the goal. If I teach you, you'll just share it with the community. Like this guy. Like, you know, like home labbing is like, it's all like... It's like like home labbers are like the heroes because, you know, you don't do this because you're it's for work. You do this because you enjoy labbing. And if someone builds something awesome like this and then you improve on it, 
or you build something cool, you'll share it. And it just gets better, right? That's what I'm going to do. So whatever people are building, I'm going to share it with you guys. I'm going to show you guys to learn it because if I teach you guys, you'll have good stuff too and you'll, and you, and you'll reciprocate it. You'll, you'll share stuff too. And we'll just keep this series going and we'll just build an awesome thing. I mean, she, there's going to be a lot of cool things. Like this is going to be awesome, guys. Like if we have this all set up, dude, like how awesome is, is that going to be, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I have kids. I don't know if you have if you have kids, but um, content filtering. She she's four now, but content filtering. I need to do content filtering. And I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about at the uh, you know device level. I'm talking about globally, like on my whole network filtering that content, controlling the sites, but as well as um, maybe doing like a workflow and like also, cat and what if they're on their cell phones? Like how do, we, how do we protect against that? If they flip over to the cell phone, how do you protect against that? Or if they use their PS4, like I'm not gonna lie, I use my PS4 to go watch, uh, I went to like, I went to adult sites on my PS4 um, or whatever, like, PS, you know, like kids, they're going to try to figure out if there's a will, there's a way, right? You know, it's like water flow. It's like you go where there's the least resistance. So think about, think about kids because help me with kids. Help me with like protecting my kids, like tracking my kids. Yeah, let's track our kids. Like tracking our iPhone activity. Track iPhone activity. That's an API, but I know API guys. So just help me figure this out. Like I can build that API but I need to know like what those API pieces are. Track iPhone. Google probably has it, but tracking iPhone. Like, how do we do that? Um, like, you know, protecting from this content, right? You know? Nanny cam. Nanny cam, kids, tablets. Yeah, exactly. You're right, Andrew. Hmm. Get the MAC address, then build up a network rule. Get the MAC address, then build a network rule. Hmm. Yeah. And then automation from Sentinel. Here's another thing. Oh yeah. Here's where we go. This is probably like, this is probably like future state. Like, let's talk about version two. But version two, man. Once we have all this stuff built out and automation and all this stuff built out, think about machine learning. What do we want to do with machine learning? Like I know maybe you never dipped your toes into it and I haven't much done much either, but think about machine learning. Like here's a scenario that um, I built out for fun, but it might be an actual use case. Imagine that someone comes into your house and you want to do facial recognition run it through a facial recognition. So basically, we think uh, if Ring, does Ring have an API? Let's figure out who has APIs. But we, we get a face. We take that face. We run it upstream to machine learning. And it already has a data sample of my face and everybody that's been whitelisted. And then when we see an abnormal face, something that's not recognized, it sends us a text message with a picture, with an approval or something like that, or a push or push app. And then we say, do you recognize this person? And if you say yes, whitelisted, like as a friend, right? Dropping off something. But if it's not, and you say no, um, do something. Like, what do you want to do? Like, I was thinking, oh, let me write this down. Machine learning, like, uh, facial recognition, like facial recognition. And what we're going to do is, um, from the face, you know, we need to whitelist our face. We want to have a good, um, you know, data set of our faces so we can whitelist our face and anything abnormal, it triggers an alert. It triggers something. It turn it, it, well, it does something like, what do you want to do? You know, here's a thought. So 
if anybody knows, if anybody knows, um, what about a, uh, if I don't know who you are, I have a drone somewhere that will um, trigger, right? And then fly up, it gets an API call from Sentinel or something, or a cognitive services, whatever. And it flies, right? And then it will go follow the person and go take a picture of his license plate. Yeah, let's, yeah. What do you think, guys? Is that possible? With the technology we have, whitelist, um, um, and then, um, you know, is that possible? Like, if it's a yes, do that. But if it's a no, send a drone out, follow him, take a picture of his license plate because he was at our house that we didn't know, and follow him for like, uh, maybe, how long's the battery? Like 20 minutes? Follow him for like a couple minutes, five minutes, so that you have that data to report. You have like, you're, you're like, yeah, he's at a, He's over. He, uh, he's he, he's on he's on that road right now, and then uh, you know follow him for like five ten minutes so you can report who he is. That would be great even for um, neighborhood watch, like a neighborhood watch program. Have that drone go around like a neighborhood watch program. Yeah, like a neighborhood neighborhood. I know, man. We're getting we're getting kind of. I'm just now just again the guys. It's just like brainstorming neighborhood watch drone <laughs> and it can go every day or maybe like every hour let it charge up go out and fly around and then go back and land go up and fly around and land you know you know you know you're trying to protect your house so it's good data right <laughs> ap and anpr does that automatic number plate recognition u.s states have similar system it tracks them parking fines Palantir, have that as additional dangerous technology. Palantir, oh, hmm. Let me look at that. Dangerous means like we shouldn't be doing it. Like, is is it illegal? Is this stuff that I'm doing illegal? I mean, is this illegal? Like, guys, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're it's literally somebody at our house. We don't know who they are, and then we want to follow them, right? Um, I've been. I know how to control a drone via API. I've, I've already looked at API development code. I can control a drone via API, but I cannot, I don't know how to, f I don't know how to do a charging station. I've been waiting for an external charging station so that I can have my drone automatically launch and go do stuff. And I wanted to have like a little open cover thing. So like open up, fly out, come back, charge, and then close the box. Like we've got to, we probably have to build that, you know, but it would be a pretty cool idea, right? Palantir, like Lord of the Rings. Palantir. Oh, Lord of the Oh, I don't even know what the name is. Wait, hold on. Let me look at it. Hold on. Let me look this up. Palantir. Pa Palantir? Ter. Lord of the Rings. What? Palantir. A Palantor. Palant. A Palantir? Dude, it's been so forever for Lord of the Rings. Ah, uh, ah, Pippin and the Palantir. Pippin. Pippin and the Palantir. What does it, what does it do? Like, does he see everything? He looks, whoa. It's like a see-all? But I, what is he happening? <laughs> oh, like a palanter. You see everything. You know what, too? Like, that would be good, because you know what? I also have, um, I also have, uh, have to, you know, watch my parents. So this is great to watch your parents, too. Like, um, watch, watch parents, right? Um, Yeah, you like you wanna you wanna you wanna um watch parents. You know? 
make sure they're okay, right? You know? Right, yeah. Like, you want to monitor, like, make sure your parents are okay. Um, you also, yeah, you could get really crazy with machine learning, huh, guys? Like, think it, let's just think about it. How about this? When, you're, when my daughter has a car and she drives, I know I basically build a data set of the common locations she's visited, like her friends and stuff. And if it's abnormal and she's visiting someone I don't know, where is she going? <laughs> if, it's, if it's not a store and it's in a residential house, where is she going? <laughs> yeah. Like car machine learning, right? She ain't 18 yet. She ain't 18 yet, guys, right? We, have a, we still have a responsibility to protect her. I watch too much uh, CSI, uh, you know, Dateline. I watch too much of these, like, unsolved mysteries. I can't have that happen to my kid. <laughs> yeah, machine learning. Um, learn, about, learn about cars. Oh, no, driving pattern. Driving too fast. <laughs> like, is this possible? Driving too fast. We need, we need to find a pi Someone needs to go find a Python machine learning thing. Like, I'm willing to learn it, but I, I, I want to get, like, a jump start. Uh, I have Jupyter Notebook, so I can kind of figure it out. But we need, like, driving too fast, driving pattern, abnormal location visited. Because you know what? Here's the thing. We're tracking the phone, right? Abnormal location. And you know a lot, and you know a lot of people, they have those watches too. So I want to track the uh, track watches too. So we need, we need to track, we need to track watches, right? We need to track watches and phones. Track watches and phones, right guys? All right? And, uh, yeah, and if she goes to a, you know, a boy's house, then you can kind of like, ah, where were you going, you know? Um, what else? What can, make, what can make life easier for home? I'm like, I'm, I'm a lazy guy. That's why I spend um, two weeks to build something, to, to, to um, automate something that, takes, that really only takes me like a couple minutes. But I would rather not ever have to do it and then save those couple minutes. Because if you take those couple minutes and you save it and you save time, then eventually I'll, uh, I'll get my money back or I'll get my time back, right? Maybe a small app to broadcast. Yeah. Small app. Yeah. Home Assist. Maybe we can integrate that with Home Assist somehow. Yeah. Let me need to check on that. Does it integrate with Home Assist? Integrate. Integrate with Home Assist. Yeah, that's a good idea. With Home Assist. Yeah, man, good idea. Man, that, see, that I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to think about this by myself, guys. Like, this is really good stuff. Lighting automation with Node-RED. Yeah, I love Node-RED. Yeah, I actually know Node.js. I actually know Node.js. Yeah, Node-RED. Home automation with Node. Yeah, let me put that over at Homebridge. Where's, where's all my crap? All right. Um, Homebridge. Node red. Good idea. I got to build a... Do we have a Docker container for that? Node red. Um, home automation. So Node red will basically... What's going to happen is Node red will get that call... And it will be like it'll get the it'll get the information, and then it can actually trigger a REST API call over to like some machine learning, feed the data, and then Sentinel actually does machine learning. Sentinel does machine learning, and it does entity-based. Sentinel does machine learning and entity-based analytics. Look, guys, let me show you something. I don't know if you know about it, but Sentinel does something where. Maybe we can use it to, like, in our home lab scenario. Here, let me show you. Let me show you real quick. I know I'm, I know I'm deviating, but you're going to like it. Trust me. So Sentinel will take the data and run it through machine learning and build an entity, okay? So when it builds an entity, here's what's going to happen. 
You're going to like it. Watch. Now, when it goes here, we go to Azure Sentinel. Watch this. Do I have an entity for this one? Uh, entity Behavior Analytics. No, it's not, I'm not allowed in this one. Let me, let me go to my other one. Entity Behavioral Analytics. Um, and what, what is the entity, guys? What is the entity? It represents something, right? Whether it's an IP address, whether it's something, but entity-based analytics. Here's, here's, here's something to think about. Like you guys heard about SolarWinds and things like that. Here's how you counter SolarWinds. I'm going to tell you right now. And I want to do the same thing for my home. So think about this. It's going to be good. Uh, let me show you this scenario. Um, Entity-based analytics. Come on, come on. So what's the scenario is, um, why is it not loading? All right, here's the scenario. Let me, let me just, I'll show you whenever it loads. Um, you know how you have to do whitelist and blacklist? I, you know, I was thinking about it. So what you know you have to do whitelist and blacklist. What about something like this? A entity is a computer, right? An entity could be a person, right? An entity could be an IP address. Oh no, IP. Like, right? And I'm gonna put circle these as entities. This is entity, this is entity. Oh man, this is not good. They're all entities, right? Azure Sentinel has a thing called entity-based analytics. Now, this computer, right, has only talked to these IPs. So it, it talked to five IPs, like, right? And so let's say this is a server, an update service, um, an API, five IPs. So you build a baseline. You learn about it over the course of a month or two weeks. This IP address is an entity. So if you have abnormal behavior, right, what happens? If you have a new IP pop up, what happens? You block it. You don't need a whitelist or blacklist anymore. You block an entity because it's abnormal behavior. It's never been learned before. Like you've never seen it before. So you have a server that only talks to the service and then abnormal behavior gets blocked. An IP address. Maybe this IP address has only talked to this IP, right? And then new IPs it's talking to, whatever. That's an abnormal behavior. So you're building sort of baselines or models or uh, machine learning around these entities, and then anything abnormal gets blocked. You no longer have to whitelist, blacklist, or anything. You're just learning what normal behavior to look like and block abnormal. You no longer have to block hashes, file names, IPs, domains. Like think about that, right? That's gonna be that's gonna be so awesome to do that. So now you have entity-based analytics and you go to entity behavior. Joey, right here, you it builds a timeline for you. It takes the logs and stitches it all together. We can do the same thing for our own home logs. And then you get a line of what happens. But here's the cool thing. Let's dig deeper. Oh, that computer. Oh, let's look at it. Let's look at this entities. Oh no, oh, I'm sorry. But that computer. Uh, let me go to Joey C. Ah, I didn't show you right. All right, let's look at him. Joey C. We want to look at activity. Let's try to find something I can pop open. But this one, you you can pop open certain things. Like here, boom. You see that? See that? Because the entities are matching, so it's correlating it across the ecosystem. And then we go to Woodgrove. Let's go to Woodgrove, right? And then we go here. I want to go look at the uh, related alerts. Boom. Related alerts. Go here. Boom. We're just digging. We're digging entities. We're not digging logs, guys. We're digging entities, IPs, domains, files. Look at this, right? Isn't that amazing? And we can do the same thing with our home lab. Like, imagine if we can build this out with our home lab. Oh my gosh, that's going to be so much cool data, like an entity. Could be, you know, doing this. Entity could be like our drone. I don't know, but you guys get the picture? Like, isn't that amazing? Entity-based analytics. Yeah, look into it. But 
the same concept could be applied for like protecting our home, right? You know, identifying entity, abnormal behavior, right? It's abnormal that my daughter went over to this location uh, or out of the country. You know, you can go find her and feed that information to the police and have them help. You know, it'll be good data to find her. And you haven't been able to reach her, but she's wearing her watch, right? That's still tracking. You know, things like that. Um, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Do you guys want to? Do you guys? Uh, you guys want to call it? I think I'm done. I think this is good stuff for 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 like a brainstorming session. In the next one, I think that we want to, What we want to do is. Uh, I'm going to build a Visio diagram, you know, and then, uh, or uh, that's going to be a hard diagram. And then uh, we'll start going at it now. Now that we have sort of a, a concept, I think we're going to start off with uh, building the, you guys want to start off building the Docker swarm first or building the firewalls and building the network first? Do you want to build the network first or do you want to build the firewall first? Or do you want to build the, the storage array first? Like, what do you want to learn first? What do you think is going to be the good starting point? And then we build on top of it. Do you want to have all our networks ready, isolated, and we stick them in the right spots? Because you can't really build your Docker Swarm if you don't have your networks. Because your Docker Swarm, you can actually point it to different VLANs and things like that. Like, you can't really build that out until you have other pieces set up. You know? Like, what do you guys think? Well, what would be the... Starting point, or with a firewall. Like, just let's start off with the PFSense firewall, and we'll start with, start off with building a good firewall cluster, and then start off from there. Use Lucid Chart. It's better. Lucid Chart. What's Lucid Chart, guys? Lucid Chart. Is that like Grafana? Lucid Chart. Lucid Chart is a web-based priority that allows you to collaborate on drive. Oh. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll Lucid Chart it then. I'll Lucid Chart it. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, let me write it down. Let me write it down. Action items. Action items, guys. I will do this. Lucid Chart. Okay. And we're gonna build. We're gonna build Lucid Chart. And you guys can collaborate on it and try to help me figure it out. But this is this is the thing. We're gonna build it out together, guys. So do we wanna start off with the firewall sir first and the network? Yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah. Yeah, please send me your please send me your stuff. Let me give you my email. You can send it to um server dot XYZ. It might, I think teach team might work, I don't know. I don't know if I set up the alias yet. But Lucid Chart, share me your diagrams. We'll start off from, yeah, we'll start off. If you already kind of have stuff built out, if you don't mind, then we can collaborate on it or make a copy of it and then we'll collaborate on that shared source because we want everybody to put ideas on it. Oh, really? I'll be interested in knowing, like, is there anything I missed, Matthew? Like, look at it real quick. Is there anything I missed? You came kind of late. Let me go over what I, what I talked about. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a traffic load balancer. We are gonna have a Docker Swarm cluster with three VMs. We're gonna have a replicated file system on each VM. So it's gonna have, it's gonna mount a drive that's gonna be replicated across these VMs that the Docker's will store their configs and stuff like that. And you know, so it can, if one dies, the other one boots up. So a replicated file system using a Ceph SS or Gluster FS, right? Um, Ceph FS or Gluster FS. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have um, OAuth and SS single sign on on top of that load balancer. We're going to have a Cloudflare, um, you know, we're going to have a Cloudflare um, CDN that's in front with proxy protection. And if you pay $20 a month, you get firewall protection and all kinds of cool stuff. But we're gonna have a proxy at the front end to do um, the, uh, what is it guys? Proxy is gonna block the IP address. CDN is going to cache those, you know, cache those services. And yeah. And then the firewall could block things too. And DDoS protection, DDoS protection, yeah. 
um, syslog server. We're going to centralize the logs. All the logs from the Docker environments is going to centralize. So here's the cool thing about syslog. If it connects to the Docker socket, all those Docker logs, bam, gets ingested. The only thing is you may have to kind of, in the configuration, you don't have to log it. So you're going to have to make sure we're logging it to the uh, STD out port. Uh, Pi-hole for DNS content filtering and, uh, con you know, protecting our, uh, you know, from visiting for certain sites and then, you know, something like that. Uh, Ansible to automatically build out the environment within 10 minutes. Um, that's the goal. I think I can do it within 10 to 15 minutes. It's usually I, I, go, I go grab a drink and I come back. I don't really know when when it happens, but Ansible is going to basically, we're going to have the Docker Compose, we're going to have the Docker Swarm, we're going to have Ansible. That way, if we just want to wipe everything and just build it from scratch, we got everything. Oh, a WAF. Yeah. Is there a free WAF, guys? I haven't really looked at WAF. So I used to work at Alert Logic, and they had a WAF. Alert Logic had a WAF, but it was I think it was enterprise grade. But... Is there a WAF we can put in front of that thing? That'd be a good idea for like SQL injections and things like that. Yeah, why not? Is there a free one, guys? Is Cloudflare free? Is, there, is Cloudflare a free WAF? Yes, we're gonna use Azure Sentinel. So you're gonna learn about Azure Sentinel. We're gonna build these um, you know, uh, deployment scripts that's gonna build workspaces, it's gonna build the uh, Everything, we're going to do Sentinel like this, guys. We're going to do Sentinel like, you know, whatever I showed you whenever you saw that, that uh, tracking the person, like the entity-based analytics. So, yeah, we're going to do Azure Sentinel. Yeah, definitely. That's where we're going to aggregate the logs. And we're going we're gonna to call the logs. We're going to call the logs at the syslog collector. So let me show you real quick. If you go to the syslog collector, um you want to call that log at the collector. You don't want all the logs coming in, so you want to go to our syslog. This is just something, if you already have syslog set up, um, you want to like set up uh, a thing on the box. Oh, I got to connect to my container, one second. Um, uh, history, grep, docker, exec. Sorry guys, let me, uh, Bash into my box. I'm making a, I'm making a a, a syslog Docker container. Oh, what is it? Oh, let me try this one. So, you want to go to Etsy R syslog dot D, and let me make it bigger for you guys. It's so small. Um, appearance twenty six. You want to go to, uh, oh, that's big. Oh, anyways, you want to go to Etsy, rsyslogd, and you want to do this one. You want to, you know how like firewall rules like start off with like, like 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever. So the, um, if you have the uh, Azure Sentinel agent, it's 95 and um, this one, but the Ceph collector, you put as a 10. And I have a, if you look at my Sentinel videos, you're going to see it, of uh, building that collector if you want to build one. But do something like this, guys. Call the data at the collector. So you say if message contains teardown, built up, this, that, this, that, then you send it to Sentinel. Only send Sentinel really interesting things you're going to take action on. That way you're not going to spend a lot of money. Like you're going to get a very small, like maybe like five, 10 buck Sentinel bill, right? And you can use Sentinel and do a lot of things, but you don't want to send everything up there, right? Only the important stuff, right? So you want to call that data at the collector and then and then you want to do a stop. You see that stop, stop. That will stop any actions below that, okay? More specific at the top, yeah, exactly. So it's gonna be, it's like bam, 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 bam. And then it goes to the regular stuff, the regular logging. If you stop it, that means you don't want it anywhere else, right? Um, yeah, Sentinel, it's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna start integrating that. Uh, backups, Google Drive. We also want to have um, Let's Encrypt. We, so here's another thing. We want, if we spin up a, a Docker container in the swarm, we want it to automatically show up in traffic. And then we want it to automatically get a SSL certificate. And we are going to have a wildcard certificate. We want it to go to the 
um, Cloudflare and add a, uh, a DNS entry, all right? We want it to then, um, now it's routable, right? Now we can visit it, bam, right? And then, um, oh yeah, we also need to do it for Pi-hole, guys. If we add it, that's what I have to do. So if you add a DNS entry on Pi-hole, I add a local IP and then I add an external IP for, um, you know, Cloudflare, right? SSL decryption. Hmm. Hmm. SSL decryption. I don't see why not. That's great for labbing, great for troubleshooting. I don't see why not. Um, you mean like, uh, what was that one? Um, what's that popular one? Starts with a B. It starts with the B, guys. SSL decryption, it acts as a, uh, a proxy. Um, it's one of the red team tools. What's that tool called? It starts with a B. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure you guys know. Um, I have a PA2200 doing now. PA2200. Okay. SSL decryption. No, I like that. P is that free? What's a PA2200? Is that free? Like, what is that? Oh, Palo Alto. You have a Palo Alto at home? At, and how much do you pay for that? <laughs> I'm, I'm here with PFCent. I don't, I don't have no Palo Alto. You probably got a good deal on that. Usually people at home lab and have like a Palo Alto or have like a Cisco, uh, you know, Meraki. They either paid for it or they, draw, they joined a lot of webinars or something like that. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Nice, nice, man. What do you think so far? I mean, we're not setting up, a, we're not gonna set up a, a routing infrastructure. We're not gonna, I mean, when, I mean, if you want, if you want, man, I know, I, I, I used to, oh, so I, I, I used to have a CCIE, but it's expired now, but I used to, got, I got my CCIE, and uh, what I did was, you guys, you guys know uh, the uh, GNS, GNS, is it GNS3? The GNS3 to spin up your like, I'm sure you knew about that. You got to save money. But I built a whole rack and GNS3. And um, you want to spin up a whole routing environment, maybe like a GNS3 cluster. Like that'd be cool. Like a GNS3 cluster. Connect something on the cluster and then boom, boom, boom. And like, like is that like, is it Dockerized yet? Like, are they Dockerizing it yet? GNS3 will be wicked. Oh, what's this? GNS3. Um, Man, I thought I would be leaving. Um, GNS3 and what's this one you have? EV. I don't even know this new one. NG. So you can set up, if you guys want to learn networking, we can set up a little Docker swarm. If you guys find a container or Docker thing that has GNS3, boom, we got that. Right? Yeah. All right. Can you install that on Docker? Can install in bare metal. So we need, bare, we need a bare metal machine with it. And then you need a switch and things like that and VLANs and things like that. And I remember GNS3, you plugged into a port and you have to do everything that a port and that punks a trunk. That port is like a trunk port connected to your main host. That's what it was. Oh yeah, guys, I got an idea. Here's another one. We didn't talk about it, but it's free and we have to set it up. You probably don't know either, uh, Matthew. Well, maybe you do. Here we go. Mind meld. So uh, one of my colleagues, his name's Rin, told me about mind meld. You guys know what mind meld is? Who knows what mind meld is? Oh, maybe you know Matthew, because you have Palo Alto, right? Mind meld has whitelist and IP address entries, right? So think about you're building your own you're building your own whitelisting, uh, blacklisting, right? So you're ingesting logs and then you're feeding IP address whitelist or blacklist. You feed it up to Sentinel. Sentinel does an action, sends it back to MindMeld and says, hey, add this whitelist entry, add this blacklist entry, add your whitelisted IPs, add this. It becomes a data point to, to, to work around. And then you can mine data from threat feeds, right? So... Imagine that now you're adjusting those uh, thread feeds, but maybe you want a whitelist, 
right? Maybe you just want to get the whitelist, and it comes it comes to you as a is it a JSON? Let's see. There it comes as a text like there, a feed, and then you take that and do what you want with it, right? Literally, that is mind melt. It's correlating IPs. It's like just a way to kind of manage manage it and kind of whitelist and blacklist things and. Yeah, so we'll we'll add that we'll add that too. We're gonna mind meld. We're gonna have mind meld to this stuff. I already got I already got it working in a Docker swarm environment. It, it's already a Docker service. If one dies, the other one boots up. Like it's already it's already clustered up. I think we need a zoom for this. <laughs> zoom. What zoom? Why do you need zoom for? Teams. Teams is free now, guys. You don't know that? Teams is free now. There's a free there's a free Teams now. You don't need Zoom. Teams is free now. And in Teams you can set up like the the thing. The the tabs. Teams is free now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So what else do I what else do I got? Um what else? So we're also gonna have Plex, right? We also want to have uh, automatic downloaders for, um, you know, taking care of our backups, you know, for our things. Um, what else do I want? Oh, guys, man, I, I keep having ideas. Bitwarden. Bitwarden. Okay, Bitwarden. What's Bitwarden, guys? You guys know what? Bit, you guys even know what Bitwarden is? So my friend Min said, hey, I don't want to pay for one password. So Bitwarden is a local hosted thing, right? Oh yeah, Discord. Yeah, Discord. Let's, yeah, we need Discord. Yeah, we need Discord. Good idea. Good idea, guys. Let me write it down. Discord. You guys know about Bitwarden? Look at this. I mean, look at this list we're making. Look at these good ideas. All right. Um, Bitwarden is like one password. But you store it on your system. You don't. It doesn't go anywhere. You carry everything into. Um, you carry everything into here, and it stores locally. And you become the one password. You can provide one password for other people. It's pretty cool. And then you're storing everything locally. It doesn't go outbound. And because you have a cluster environment, that shit's going to be pretty uh, reliable unless you go through a, an, another cold freeze like me and uh, me and Jake did, right? <laughs> so. Um, yeah, dude, let's set up our own one password, our, our own, you know, way to store passwords so we can have password lists. We don't have to store the passwords, right? Bitwarden. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I use one password right now, but we're going to cluster that up. We'll cluster it up too. We're going to have a Docker swarm and cluster up every, and everything. Um, what else? What else, guys? Um... What else? Anything else? Like, think about it. Bitwarden is, is, is really helpful because it's going to help manage passwords. I think you can do a, f in one password, you can do a family mode. So I, what I do is I have my own private stuff I log in with, and then I have a shared one. And the shared one I share to many people. And then you know, they can get my Netflix password, my Disney, my Disney Plus password, my Xfinity password. So we have like a shared login thing that we all collaborate and use, you know. And then if we share the password, you just kind of, you go back to one password and do that. So does Bitwarden have something like that? I don't know. But that'd be, I think we should do a Bitwarden and save some money there, all right? Um, let me look, let me look what else I have on my stuff. What else do we want? Oh, we, do we need a wiki? You guys want a wiki on your, like, do you want a wiki, like a, a little wiki set up too? Like with a wiki, like, would you want a wiki like automatically built out and then you can like put notes on that thing? Like, is that a good idea? Or maybe we can note it and then when we note it, it we push it to GitHub and then it, it populates the wiki? I don't know. Like, that'd be pretty cool, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um... A wiki, like, would you guys like a wiki? Um, what else do I got? We got backing up, well, backing up our Google Photos, backing up that stuff. We've got 
Um, what else? What else? Oh, you guys want Splunk? We could put Splunk. Let's put Splunk. I got it. I, I got it already working, guys. I already have Splunk working. It's in the swarm too. The reason I have it is I gotta learn it right. So yeah, I got I got it working just to show you. Look, it's already in a swarm. Splunk. Yep. See, bam. We got Splunk, guys. You want you guys want Splunk? We could log. We we could do Splunk too. So you can mess around there. Send those logs to Sentinel. Maybe log to Splunk. Like whatever you want. It's, you know, if you don't want to spend, you want to save some money. You could just do it here. You don't want to do it as your resource we could do it here too so i got this already loading up in the swarm as well so i got the container again you don't have to do that i already have the config file you just literally go to ansible run it and then bam 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 bam, bam it all spins up you're going to need the box though i don't know if you can run a raspberry pi backblaze backblaze oh yeah backblaze what is backblaze is that is that's a storage, right? That's like a storage thing, right? I didn't. That's like a storage thing. Yeah, cloud storage. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that free or something? What's the interest in Backblaze? Uh, okay. Okay. Backblaze. Make a note of that. All right. What else? We got? So I got yeah, I got Splunk. Um, cause you know I, I gotta test things out. I gotta lab too. That's that's the point. Like once this is set up, guys, you don't have to use this all. Just go to Portainer, right? We're gonna go to Portainer, right? And you go to Portainer. Don't use it all. We're not gonna use it all. Just go to App Templates. I'm gonna be loading all these App Templates, and you just load what you want, and then bam, it populates. So pick what you want, right? That's that's the goal, right? We're gonna make a catalog of things um to automatically spin up and then yeah let's spin up the containers and services and then remote into these things yeah i love i love portainer guys i love portainer um oh ansible hey does anybody know how to get ansible f like the, the the gui free like, does Ansible have a free GUI? I know Ansible Tower is, but I think you have to pay for that, right? Does Ansible have a GUI? Can we do, like, an Ansible GUI? Does, action, okay, action action items. We need to find out, guys. Lucid chart, and does Ansible have a free GUI? Because I don't really, if we don't have to do it in command line, we don't, we don't want to, right? You know, so is, is Ansible Tower free? Ansible Tower, is that free? Um, Portainer. Um, what about Rundeck? You guys know what Rundeck is? Rundeck is like an automatic script thing. So what you can do is set up a script to like, if you want to reboot all your servers, you do Rundeck. Or if you want to do this, you could do Rundeck. But then again, you got Ansible, so like, you got Ansible and Rundeck. Like, if you make a machine and you have it, if you and you give it certain roles, you don't really need Rundeck. You just set up a cron job and do a pull, and just pull new configs, right? So, yeah, yeah, please do, Matt. But Ans like an Ansible Tower, that'd be cool. Yeah, like have like a GUI thing. I think it is, but maybe you know, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But that'd be pretty cool. Ansible Tower. Uh, what else? What else I got set up? Oh yeah, oh yeah. A private GitHub, private GitHub, a private GitHub repo you can store your your crap on, right? All this crap, all this stuff you're doing, you want a private GitHub repo. You want to put this all on a private Git. Oh, hub repo. And then you want to um, also, you want to do a private GitHub repo and also do a hub, you want, you want a Docker hub. We also need a Docker hub. We're gonna spin up a Docker hub repository. That way we will store the images locally and not have to go ingest it from the internet. We're gonna have our own Docker hub. Docker hub, yeah, a registry, that's it. 
Docker Hub registry to automatically just, yeah, I like that. What do you guys think? Are we done? <laughs> Is this, are we done, guys? <laughs> All right, all right, Matt. Could you uh, could you make a diagram of this on Lucid Chart again uh, uh, by tomorrow? Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, man. <laughs> no, um, Guacamole is a uh, a web-based uh, remote session. So remotely, it's like a web browser. It's like a web browser remote session. So you can RDP, SSH, VNC, all through Guacamole, and you could do cool things like um. You know, feed a uh, have it do things based off the uh, URL string and things like that. So you can have a like, you can have a Docker compose automatically spin up, and then you automatically provis provision the Docker compose. It gets a pyhole instance, and then you have a guacamole ready to be logged into because it has a cert because it copied that it copied that um, public cert of the machine that you're logging to. So guacamole is going to have the private cert, and then when the any Docker container spins up. You have the public cert, put it in, and that Docker guac that guacamole can just log in. Never had to configure it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna be good. What do you guys, what do you guys think? <laughs> I know, but look, look how much we're gonna learn, everybody. Like this is a lot of maintain. This will probably take five years. But did you? Did the Plex server take part in that DDoS the other day? Uh, I don't know, Jake. Maybe. <laughs> and once you get it with Lucid Chart set up, I'm just <laughs> um, yeah. Plex. What else, guys? Oh, um, if you guys don't know, Jellyfin's also pretty good. Jellyfin doesn't actually um go through Plex, so you don't actually have to go through Plex and route through Plex. Jellyfin is like all all hosted. It's like a Bitwarden. So look up look up look up Jellyfin if you have a chance. Jellyfin. Let me see if mine works. Let me see if my Jellyfin works. Yeah, um, but Jellyfin's pretty cool. If you guys want to uh, run it locally, it's up and coming. It doesn't have all the cool features, but it plays things. It plays blah. It does all this stuff and whatever. It plays it all, dude. Yeah. You know. But I mean, dude, if we set this up, look how smart we're gonna be. We're like, well, look, look how smart we're gonna be after all this. We're gonna know Ansible, Plex. We're gonna know Open SSL, SSL, uh, SSL. We'll have everything. We'll have envi an environment probably like better than uh, you know a lot of organizations I know of. You know, like because they move slow, right? We can move fast. So I think you need to put this in print, share it in one note or something. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll share it. I'll share it with you guys. I need to start my own YouTube channel. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll promote you. And by the way, uh, Jake, send p provide your link. Provide your late link, Jake, of your um of your product. So Jake has a product that, and I'll do a video about it later. But he has he he was building a uh, a device that basically um is like an open sense box. So if you don't want to build a server and stuff, but you want that protection, it's like a little open sense box. And then uh, you just pay monthly and then uh, you just pay for the hardware and then you pay monthly and then he will protect your shit for you. He'll scan it and uh, he'll protect content filtering. He'll, it has all these cool graphs and all these cool things. Like I'll do a video later uh, once, I, uh, once I get my hands into it. Um, but yeah, um, it's gonna be pretty good. So yeah. Hmm. What else? All right, guys. I think that's it. I will. Uh, thank you for the uh, information, Matt. I will share this. I'll put the link in the video. So if you want it, I'm gonna put the link in the video so everybody can access it. Um, we'll. I'll also put the uh, Lucid chart in the video that Matthew has shared, and then from there. We can collaborate, and uh, we're gonna start off slow, guys. This is gonna be like not five years. Like I have a lot of these Docker composers, but it'll be a while because we're gonna go. We're gonna. I, I'm not gonna just tell you to like, hey, run this, and then you're you're good. I'm gonna show you how it works, and I'm gonna teach you about it. So by the time we're done, 
you know everything. You know all this. And then you could use it for work and stuff like that, you know? All right? Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, and this was a lot. This was really good. I, I was worried that we wouldn't have a lot of uh, feedback, and I would be doing all the talking. So this is awesome. Um, and whoa, 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 whoa. Which one's good? Is this one better? I got to fix my green screen. But yeah, so we will uh, we'll talk later. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good day. Stay safe. Uh, yeah, that's it. I don't really know what to say. I usually, uh, I usually can cut. I usually can cut what I do wrong. But in live streams, I can't really. Uh, I can't really cut anything. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah, go get some water, man. I haven't drank it. Here, here. I got some water right here. Yeah, Jake. Did you get the smart? Did you guys get the link again? For anybody that joined late. Look up this smart, smart home traffic docker. I think that's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll put the link in the description as well. But here's a link. I'll put a link in the chat. Smart home docker. You're gonna have. You're gonna go in the rabbit hole with this. It's literally a uh, someone spent the time to build. Like, look at the docs. It's so long. But he that shows how thorough he was. He built everything right. Low balancer, OAuth, Athelia, um, throughout the Docker Swarm, all that stuff. We're gonna take it a step further. We're gonna replicate the Docker Swarm and things like that. He, he only did a he only did a one machine. We're gonna replicate across three machines and do replicated file system, and then Ansible on top of that. But yeah, it's gonna be awesome. All right, guys, have a good one. Thank you for joining. Uh, stay safe and have a good day.